Welcome, everyone, to Melchizedek Christian Church. Glad to see your lovely faces. I have a wonderful message for you tonight. Hope you think so, too. We're going to find out. But the title of my message tonight is, I Hate Esau. How many of you guys have heard that scripture before? Jacob have I loved, but Esau I hated. We're going to talk about that tonight, what that means, and look at Esau and his life and his descendants. Um, but I want you to leave here tonight with um, a realization, not just of who Esau is, but also of who you are and what God wants and has for your life. Um, if you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9, we're going to start reading in verse 6, where Paul tells us a little history. Chapter 9 of Romans, verse 6, reads as follows. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's seed. But through Isaac, your seed will be named. That is, it is not the children of flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise who are regarded as seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Now, first things first, the quote here of Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated comes from the book of Malachi, a minor prophet in the Old Testament, and comes from chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, essentially. And Malachi starts off by telling Israel, essentially, how much God loves them. And he says, Esau I have hated. Okay, And so it's a picture of, of the descendants of Esau, um, the Edomites, and really what they represent, which we're going to talk about. But take note here that a lot of people take this scripture and they try to say that this is in the, in the five points of Calvinist, Calvinism, this is the L. TULIP is their little acronym and the L stands for limited atonement. And basically what that means is that atonement is not for everyone. It's only for certain people that God elects before they're born. Some people he loves and some people he hates. And those he hates don't get saved and they go to hell. Now, that's a little harsh and they probably won't say it like that, but that's essentially what it is. Is that God says some people he's going to hate before they're born, before they're even coming to this world, and they're going to be a sinner and go to hell. That's limited atonement. And this is the scripture they use to defend it a lot of times. Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Well, this scripture reference that Paul makes is to Malachi. Okay, Jacob and Esau were born, lived, and died before Malachi even came along. And so it's a little bit of a stretch to say that God loved Jacob and hated Esau before Jacob and Esau were even born. And that's how they kind of defend limited atonement. But I'm not here to discuss limited atonement, really, um, or the whole debate. But just want you to know that, yes, God does predestine us, but this scripture does not really have to do with predestination in the sense that God is going to hate someone before they're born. Because we know that God is just, and there is no injustice with God. So, then we have to ask ourselves the question, who did God hate or what did God hate? Um, and so we're going to look at the life of Esau. If you will, turn in your Bibles all the way to Genesis chapter 27. And we're going to talk about Esau. Um, 
First, I'm just going to kind of list you um, kind of through the life of Esau, um, just about the person. If you're not familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau, before Jacob and Esau were born, the Lord told Rebekah that she would have twins and that the younger or the older would serve the younger. And when they were birthed, uh, Jacob um, came out grabbing onto Esau's heel. Um, and so there's a lot of prophetic meaning and teaching in that. But I just want to look at Esau's life, first of all, just the, the person, the man, Esau. And ask, we're going to ask ourselves, does God hate just the person, Esau, that he has created, that he has given to Rebekah and Isaac? So, in Genesis chapter 27, um, starting in verse 38 and 40, first point, 38 through 40, is I want you to realize something, is that Isaac blesses Esau with a blessing, okay? Now, we're going to find out that Esau sold his birthright, and he lost the blessing of the firstborn, okay? But... Esau was still blessed by Isaac, and in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20, it says that by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Okay, first point, Esau received a blessing from Isaac. Esau, throughout his life, never literally had to serve Jacob. He never had to actually serve Jacob. Third thing, Esau's life, growing up, all of his wives came from Canaan. All of his cattle came from Canaan. All of his sheep came from Canaan. You can see that in Genesis chapter 26, verse 34, where it says, When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Barry the Hittite, and Bazmath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Both of those women lived in the land of Canaan. In Genesis 28 through 6 and 9, It says, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Haram to take to himself a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Haram. So Esau saw the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. So he went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Neboeth. Now, in Genesis chapters 22 and 23, 32 and 33, we see that Esau, the person, is actually, um, when Jacob is told to go back into the land of Canaan, okay, he's afraid of Esau because Esau is living in the land of Canaan, and all of his cattle and sheep and wives are there, and all of his children are there. And God tells him to go back into the land of Canaan, and Jacob and Esau end up having this meeting between themselves, and Jacob is afraid. Okay, he's scared. And so out of his fear, or whatever it may be, he actually ends up offering Esau a gift. Esau refuses to take it because he says, I already have everything I need and everything I want. Why do I need to accept your gift? So he doesn't end up accepting the gift, but Jacob offers Esau a gift, and Jacob even reser- re- um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Jacob identifies himself as a servant of Esau, his lord, in this interaction. Now, Jacob is doing this in a way to get away from Esau and avoid Esau and kind of sneak off, but in the sense. It was prophesied that Esau was going to serve Jacob, was it not? But in this circumstance, Jacob, in a way, serves Esau. At least portrays himself as the servant of Esau. Um, and then in Genesis 36, it gives a, um, a list of everything that Esau had uh, in the land of Canaan. And that's at the time... Um, Isaac dies, and you start to see the descendants of Esau, um, starting in verse or chapter thirty-six of Genesis. So the person Esau had a pretty good life. You know, obviously, he sold his birthright, and he sold or didn't sell, but was deceived out of his blessing of the firstborn. But 
after this, he tries to kill Jacob. Jacob flees. He doesn't kill Jacob. But then after this, Esau's life consists of taking the wives of Canaan, having cattle, sheep, oxen, land in the land of Canaan. Now, as we all know, Canaan is the land of promise, is it not? And so this is where Esau lived his entire life with all of his family until Isaac dies. And we see that at the end of chapter 35 of Genesis, Isaac dies and it says, Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, you would think that Esau, every time he sees Jacob, is going to try to kill him, right? But here, once again, is another example where Jacob and Esau get along. They're able to bury their father with honor and respect. But then something happens, and Esau decides to move. And this is where you see Esau, um, although he's lived in Cana, he makes a decision based off land and everything that he has to move to the hill country of Seir. Um, if it's starting in verse 36, if you go through verse 8, you see that he moves to the hill country of Seir so that he can have enough room for everything he owns and possesses. And he tells Jacob there's not enough for the both of us, enough room for the both of us in Canaan, so I'll leave and I'll go to the land of Seir, um, which is also a hill country, and as we're going to find out where Mount Seir is. Now, that's the person Esau, just his life, okay? And in his life, he lived pretty good life. Biblically, you can't find anything where it said, you know, Esau suffered. Esau, you know, was a slave to Jacob. Esau did this for Jacob. Really, the only example you have is that Esau decided on his own free will that he was going to leave Canaan and go to Seir and give Jacob Canaan. So, back to the prophecy given to Rebekah, that the um, older shall serve the younger, how is that fulfilled? It's not necessarily directly fulfilled in the life of Esau, but we know that God's word is fulfilled and will not fail, and so there has to be a truth to it. And we're going to find out what that is. Secondly, the people of Esau, Esau's name is changed to Edom. Okay, Just like Jacob's name is changed to Israel, Esau's name is changed to Edom. And the Edomites are essentially the descendants of Esau and the people that belong to his lineage, his heritage, his genealogy. If you go through the whole Old Testament, there's a lot about the people of Esau, the land of Edom, the Edomites, um, the people of Mount Seir. All that is synonymous one another with one another. But let me read to you something here. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 5. You don't need to turn there. just want to read it to you. Um, talking about um, the people of Edom. Chapter 2, verse 5 of Deuteronomy says, um, or you can start in verse 2. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have circled this mountain long enough. Now turn north and command the people, saying, You will pass through the territory of your brothers, the sons of Esau. Okay, he's talking to Israel, the people, the descendants of Jacob. And he says, You're going to pass through the territory of your brothers, the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not provoke them, for I will not give you any of their land, even as little as a footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. So, the descendants of Esau were given a possession by God, which was Mount Seir. Now, this was a mountain. Um, it was, uh, I looked it up in the Wycliffe and did some research on it, and it wasn't like it was just this barren, horrid place. It was a place that was higher up. You could see it was a vantage point. Um, and it was a good hill country um, where you could raise your family and your cattle and sheep, etc. Then also in Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 24. And I'll just read this to you again. Chapter 24, verse 4. It reads, To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. So... The people of Esau, just the people, okay, not necessarily what they represent or the identity that they took for themselves, they are blessed by God. They have a possession from God. 
And all that they have and all that they acquired really came from the land of Canaan, the land of promise. Last week, Joshua gave an incredible message on Jacob being the promise, right? Jacob, just as Jacob, um, Isaac, excuse me, just as Isaac was the promise, we also are like Isaac, the promise. That's in Galatians chapter 4. And so Esau, Jacob and Esau were both the fruit of Isaac, the fruit of the promise. Jacob, as you know, goes on to be Israel and the people of Israel and the Israelites and, and the 12 tribes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from which Christ, the seed, does descend. And then you have Esau and the Edomites. The Edomites live a pretty good life, you know. But, and let me add this, that a lot of people say that Esau, that using that scripture in Romans, Esau I hated, right? That Jesus hated and God hated Esau. There was really no hope for him. He was predestined for failure. He was just predestined to be a vessel that God could show his hatred through, right? That's kind of the story they take. But if you look in Mark chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, you will find that Jesus actually preaches to some of the people of Edom. Now, it doesn't say Edom. It uses another word. It's spelled I-D-E-U-M-O-N. Edom is how it's pronounced. But it's the people of Eden. It's just another city that was in the land of Eden. So we see that Jesus even preached to some of these people. Back to our question, who does God hate or what did God hate? Looking at the life of Esau and the life of the Edomites, we see that their lives really weren't all that bad. They didn't wander in the wilderness. They didn't suffer, go without food and land and cattle and all this and all that. But God still says, Esau I hated. So it has to be true. So we have to ask ourselves, what does he hate? My conclusion is this, that what God hates is the identity that Esau and Edom choose to be. God's hatred does not have to do the, with predestination of their lives, but it has to do with the choices and the identity they accept for themselves and for their families and for their generations. And we're going to see this. Back to Genesis chapter 25 in the life of Esau. This is where it gets good. Now, I told you, just the man Esau lived pretty good life, right? And the people of Esau lived a pretty good life, and they had some pretty good things. But the identity that they choose to possess and live according to is really what God hates. And we're going to see what that identity is. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 27, it reads, When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a complete man living or dwelling in tents. This is interesting. This is when they grew up. So it says that when Jacob grew up, he was a complete man. But when Esau grew up, he was a skillful hunter and a man of the field. This speaks to the life and the identity of Esau that he has to go out and gain his provision. Whatever he's going to eat, he's going to have to hunt for. Okay, whatever he's going to live by, he's going to have to go out and get. He's going to have to go out and earn. He's going to have to go out and work the field. That's the first thing. Esau accepted the identity of being a hunter, a man of the field, in which he would go out and get his own provision and his own means of living. Secondly, still in chapter 25, verses 29, it says, When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The identity of Esau is that he tries to preserve his own life. And in preserving his own life, he sells his birthright. This is the second thing that really reflects his identity. Is that to save his natural life, he was willing to sacrifice his birthright and the promise of his birthright that he would receive from his father. 
And out of his own desire to save his life, he really ends up losing his life because his life is carried through what should have been his birthright and should have been his blessing. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 27, and we're going to see where he loses his blessing. Genesis chapter 27, verses 22 through 27. So Jacob, okay, what had happened here is that Isaac had told um, Esau that, hey, I want to bless you. You know, I'm kind of at the end of my life. I want to bless you and give you your birthright and your blessing of the birthright. And Jacob, Rebecca finds out, Rebecca tricks Jacob into saying, hey, so you can get the blessing, dress up as Esau, and this is what happens. So um, Jacob came close, verse 22, so Jacob came close to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's, so he blessed him. Now, first thing about Esau We know that it says when he grew up, he became a skillful hunter, right? So he was identified by what he gathered on his own. When Jacob comes to get the blessing of the first right, how does he receive it? He doesn't receive it based on his voice, what he says, which essentially is what he believes, because in the New Testament it says, I believed, therefore I spoke. Even Isaac recognizes Jacob's voice and says, this is the voice of Jacob. But because of his hands, Esau's hands through his own hands is what causes him to lose his blessing. Because Isaac fills of Jacob's hands that are hairy, just like Esau's. And he says, these have to be Esau's hands. Now, what do you do with your hands? You work, you make a living, you build, you strive, whatever it may be. But through your hands, if you are Esau, you will lose your blessing. Okay? Catch that. Through your hands, through your work, is how someone can steal your blessing. If your identity is in your work, is in what you build, someone can come along and build and work the same and get the blessing that you should have received. Keep reading. Verse 24. And he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. So he said, bring it to me, referring to this stew, um, or cooked meat in the stew, and I will eat of my son's game that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate. He also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father said to him, please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled, he smelled of his garments, and he blessed him and said. The second thing, before we get to the blessing, the second thing that causes Esau to lose his blessing is what he wears. Because Jacob tricks his father, essentially, even though it wasn't really trickery because Isaac was operating by faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20, where it says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. But Through the garments that Jacob is wearing, he's able to receive the blessing of Esau. So Esau loses his blessing. He loses his birthright because he wants to save his own life. He loses his blessing because of the work of his hands and what he clothes himself with. Y'all get that? Make sure you catch that. Because you can lose your blessing if your identity is in what you build, what you work on, or if your identity is in what you wear and what you clothe yourself with. Okay? That's the identity of Esau. And that's what he chose to live and have his being and identity in. His hands, his skillful skills as a hunter, being a man of the field, and also what he wore. And that's how Isaac recognized and was able to bless Jacob Because Jacob was able to put on those things even if it wasn't real. So, that's the identity of Esau. The identity of Edom. We're not going to go through all of Edom because, like I said, it's throughout all of the Old Testament. Edom is essentially the biggest enemy of Israel. Every time Israel is fighting, 
it almost always seems like someone from the land of Edom is there fighting against them. Okay? Even, even when uh, in the Exodus, uh, Israel is trying to pass through the land of his brothers, Esau and his descendants do not allow him to pass. They say, you shall not come through here. And they have all their swords and they're ready to kill him. So Edom was always fighting against Israel. But I'm going to wrap up the identity of Edom in just a couple verses. The book of Obadiah, verses 1 through 4. Turn there with me, if you will. Maybe hard to find Obadiah, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Obadiah, the book of Obadiah, the minor prophet, verses 1 through 4. There's only one chapter in the book. If you're there, say amen. That's what I got from T.D. Jakes. That's what he says. So, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us go, go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small on the, among the nations. You are greatly despised. This is what I want you to pay attention to, verses 3 and 4. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Hopefully that's sending off a couple bells in your head, because that's almost verbatim, a very, very important passage of Scripture that you will recognize. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. I'm going to read it to you. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. That's referring to the five iniquity drives, the five I wills. The same thing that Obadiah is prophesying about Edom relates directly to the five I wills and the iniquity drives of Satan that filled his heart and caused him to fall. So the identity that the Edomites lived in was really the identity of I will. I will do this, I will do that, I will do this, I will do that, I will provide for myself, I will cook, I will hunt, I will do whatever it takes to live and survive and to have what I want. So that's the identity of Esau and Edom, essentially, to wrap it up small. It's the, it's the iniquity drives. That's the identity they chose to live in and operate in and have their being in. Now, one thing that gets a little tricky is that going back to Genesis... Isaac blesses Esau. Okay? Isaac blesses Esau. Now, why would Isaac bless Esau if Isaac is supposed to hate Esau? Well, the thing is, Isaac doesn't hate Esau. Isaac loves Esau. And in Genesis chapter 25, verse 28, it says that. But the identity that Esau chooses for himself and the identity that the descendants of Esau choose to live in and operate in are the iniquities of I will be righteous, I will sustain myself, I will exalt myself, I will appoint myself, I will be displayed above all the clouds. In verse 28 of chapter 25, it tells us that Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. That's interesting. But Rebekah loved Jacob. But let's go back to where Jacob steals, essentially, the blessing of Esau. Esau comes, it's in chapter 27, verse, starting in verse 30. We're not going to read all of it. But Jacob is finished blessing, I mean, Isaac is finished blessing Jacob. Esau comes along and he finds out that Jacob has just got his blessing. And now he's sad and he's crying and he says to Isaac, I'm your son, Esau. Here's the, here's the game that I caught for you and prepared for you. Now you can bless me. And Isaac says, 
in verse 37. But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him, Jacob, your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me even also, O my father. So Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So Isaac tells Esau, I've already given everything to Jacob. What else can I do for you? But Esau insists, Isaac, surely you have to have more than one blessing. And it's true. Isaac does have more than one blessing. But the difference in the blessing of Jacob and Esau, if you turn back to verse 27 of chapter 27, it says, the blessing of Jacob is this, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you. That's essentially the difference. There's no abundance of grain or wine for Esau. But the blessing of Esau is this. Then Isaac, his father, answered him and said to him, Behold, away from the, or actually the word away there is probably as your versions read, unless you have King James Version. All the new versions of, of the Bible, the RSV, the NIV, the NLV, the NASB, all the versions after the King James Version insert the word away. It says, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth, or the fatness of the earth, shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of the hev- and away from the dew of heaven from above. But if you look in the King James Version, the word away is not there. If you go back into the Septuagint, the word away is not there. Even in the Latin Vulgate, the word away is not there. And so how this scripture really reads is, Behold, of the fatness of the earth shall be your dwelling, and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. To understand this, you have to understand Esau and Edom's identity. Their identity is I will, is iniquity, is their own self, is their own flesh, and what they can do therein. And the blessing that Isaac gives by faith, he gives by faith the blessing to Jacob that God will give to you. Okay, But knowing Esau and what has happened, Isaac blesses Esau with the blessing, essentially, of self. He says, you can be blessed with the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above, but it's not going to come from God. It's going to come from yourself. Because Isaac knows that the blessing that he's already given, the only blessing that really counts is the blessing of promise that he gives to Jacob. The blessing of self, essentially, and the blessing of doing it in your own strength is all he has left, which he would consider nothing, to give to Esau. And he says, by your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve, but it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. The two blessings are given or provided for either by God or by yourself. You can have the fatness of this earth if you go out and work for it and live by the sword and fight and give your life for the fatness of this earth. And that's all you get. You get some dew from heaven, from above. But you can be a son of promise and God will give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine and people will serve you and nations will bow down to you and you will be the master of your brothers. And your mother's sons will bow down to you. And cursed will be those who curse you. And blessed will be those who bless you. That's what God gives according to the promise. You can get a little bit of blessing if you want it out of your own strength. The fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven. But the only thing about your own strength is that it's corrupt. Your flesh is corrupt. Because your identity is according to iniquity. Outside of Christ... Your iniquity, your sin, and your transgressions, that's pretty much all you are. That's your identity. And 
if you want to work in this world, you can get a little bit of fatness. But eventually, what's going to happen is that your iniquity and your sin and your transgression is going to be so great that the fatness of the earth will start to run out. The dew will start to run out. And you'll start to lack. Because what happens with iniquity is that iniquity and sin destroys. It deceives. It brings death. Right? And so that's what happens. Maybe for a little while, the fat of the earth will last for you in your own strength. But eventually, your own iniquity, your own sin, is going to ruin even the fatness of the earth. It's going to ruin even the dew from heaven, from above. The dew of heaven from above. But this is the wonderful thing about Esau. Is that in his blessing, there was still a way of redemption. Now a lot of people theologically might disagree with that. But let me explain before you get up in arms. Okay? Now I just showed you how Esau and Edom, the identity they had for their life was that of iniquity, right? Let's listen to Esau's blessing. It says, by your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall, sh- you sh- shall serve. His brother being Jacob, which is the inheritor of the promise. Okay, So Esau, the man of iniquity, is really going to end up serving the promise. But it shall come about when you become restless, that you will break his yoke from your neck. Do you know what the yoke of the promise is? The yoke of the promise is that God gives you what you need. That's the yoke of the promise and the blessing is that God provides for you, that God protects you, that God brings those to serve you and help you. But Esau, since he's not according to the promise, this way of living where you're given things, where God provides you all that you need, all that you could ask for, it's a burden. Look at the people in the world. Look at non-Christians. Look at non-believers. How do they live? What do they want? They want joy. They want peace. They want love. They want long life. Everything the world wants is what God gives. They're just trying to get it through their own flesh, right? The only difference between me and someone who's in the world and doesn't believe in Christ is that everything I have and am comes from God. Everything he has and is comes from self. Look at Satan. Satan was the cherub that fell, right? And now what happens? He lives his whole life, his whole eternity, striving and striving and striving. And what is he striving for? He's striving for love. He's striving for peace. He's striving for security. He's striving for the blessing of the promise. That's what he wants. He doesn't want Jesus to get what Jesus deserves. He doesn't want the righteousness to be according to Christ. He wants righteousness to be according to himself because then he can be righteous. Right? He wants to be able to have glory and power. But the glory and power that he wants is not according to Christ. It's according to himself. This is the life that Esau and the Edomites chose for themselves. This is the identity they wanted. Is to say, I will do it on my own. This is the identity I accept for my life. That's tough. To save my own life, I'm willing to serve and give up my birthright. Just to save my own natural life. Why do you think so many times Christ says... If you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Isn't it interesting how much turmoil and pain and junk the descendants of Jacob went through and faced? But they're going to receive the promise. But everyone else seemingly who was fighting against the Israelites, it seemed like they always had food. They always had cattle. They always had children. They always had land. But they'll never be able to have the promise and the blessing 
of the promise. Now, there comes a point with Esau that he can get out from underneath this yoke of always trying to gain the promise through self. That's the yoke that Esau carries. If you live in this world, you will constantly be trying to strive for the promise, gaining it through yourself. And the point at which you break this yoke from your neck is the point at which you become restless. If we look at our own lives, I'm sure we can all identify parts of us like Esau. We live and we have our identity in what we can do with our hands, what we can build, what we can gain, what can we acquire. We're willing to give up anything if it'll just save our natural life. If we don't have to die today, we're willing to do anything. And our identity is in what we wear and what we put on ourselves and clothe ourselves with and hide ourselves with. Or we can be like the promise and not live like that. But if you're living a life like Esau, the point at which you can come out from under that life of iniquity, that life of self, that life of flesh, is at the point where you become restless. You try so hard to be righteous. You try so hard to be the perfect little Christian. You try so hard to do the right thing. And you end up failing and failing and failing. But God says that the blessing of Esau that Isaac gives is that when he becomes restless, he can come out from underneath self. He can come out from underneath iniquity. He can come out from underneath striving and living according to his own will and his own desires. And at that point, he has to start living according to to the promise. See, all of us were like like Esau. We lived and we did things with our hands and built and worked and said, this is what my identity is. Look at what I have. Look at my job title. Look at how much money I have. Look at my kids. Look at my children. Look at my descendants. We said, look at what I wear. But at the point when we give up, at the point where we become restless and realize I can't do it, I can't make it. I can't be righteous on my own. That's the point at which we can start to live according to the promise. Now I want to say something. And I want to conclude with Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 reads, Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. And that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he despised to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. This is the thing about living a life of iniquity, living a life like Esau and the Edomites, living a life according to your flesh and according to yourself, is that there's no place for repentance within yourself. There's no strength you can have that you can come to repentance. There's no place for repentance in that way of living. Even if you cry, even if you beg, there's still no repentance. Because you cannot be saved within yourself. You must come to Christ to be saved. Christ was crushed for your iniquity. He was beaten for your transgressions. He was crucified for our sins. The only way that we can obtain the promise, the only way we can live according to the promise and have our identity according to the promise is by giving up, is by coming to Christ and believing. Jacob lived a life of believing. 
He may not have always had it right there in front of him. He may not have always gotten what he thought he should get. But he believed, and he believed in the life of the promise. And he received the promise from Isaac. I hate Esau. What does God hate? Who does God hate? God does not hate the person Esau. But he hates the identity and the nature of the man of iniquity. The man of lawlessness. The man of flesh. The man of sin. Verse 18 in Hebrews 12. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged no further words be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command if even a beast touches the mountain it will be stoned. Even Moses, so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. This is the thing about self. The only way for you to be saved through self is to go to Mount Sinai and prove yourself righteous. But if you go to Mount Sinai and you touch the mountain, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to get your butt whooped. You're going to get stoned. You're going to get burned. You're going to get consumed. And you're going to be dead. Because you're not righteous in yourself. You can't be righteous within yourself. And the only way for you to prove your righteousness through yourself is to go to Mount Sinai and fulfill the whole law. And you cannot do it. But Mount Zion is not a mountain that can be touched. Because Mount Zion, you can only come to it through the promise. No self, no flesh... No iniquity can come to Mount Zion and touch it. No flesh can save itself. The only way you come to Mount Zion is through Christ and through the promise and the seed of Isaac. Romans chapter 9, verse 66 through 14, which we read. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved. But Esau, I hated. I personally don't believe that that this has to do with Esau just the man. Or Edomites or Edom just the land or people. This has to do with the identity. Their identity and your identity. Every day you have a choice. What is your identity going to be according to? Is your identity, is your heart, is your, gonna, is your life going to be lived according to the promise or according to your own self, to your own flesh, to your own iniquity? I can promise you that if you want to live according to yourself and your own flesh, you may have a little bit of fatness of the earth. You may taste the dew of heaven. But it's almost guaranteed someone's going to steal your birthright. And they're going to steal your blessing. Because it doesn't take much to build what you can build. Or to do what you can do in your flesh. We're all flesh. But God calls us to live according to the promise. Not a single one of us here can live and be holy and righteous. That's why we need the seed of the promise. That's why we need Christ. That's why we need to start living according to Christ. Don't let someone convince you that you might be one of the ones that God just hates from birth. Or this part of me God just hates and he just wants to destroy it anyways. What God wants is for you to live and come to the promise. And come to Christ. No matter where you are, where you come from, what you've been through or been in. You can come to Christ. And be cleaned and be washed and be regenerated and saved and redeemed. No matter what part of you, you struggle with. Don't try to fulfill it through your flesh. Bring it to Christ. Bring it to the promise. And God will work out the blessing and the birthright that he has for you according to the promise. I want to pray for you guys tonight. But I want you guys to come up here to the front as I pray for you.
it's important for us to realize God hates iniquity. God hates sin. But He loves the promise. And He loves that you can come to the promise. 